Hello, welcome to another Dave's Desk. Today I'm with an awesome professional speaker, trainer, facilitator, Sue Evans, on the subject of improving mental well being. Basically, she sorts people's heads out. Yeah, that's what she does. She's brilliant at it. Hi, Sue. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you very much. It's lovely to see you. And to you too. I know we we go we go way back, but I want I want to in the short time we've got, rather than just ask about you, your background, blah de blah. I want I want to get straight into your 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 cleverness, your your expertise. I want to pick your brains. Everybody talks about emotional well-being and mental well-being. Is there a difference? Probably not. I would see the two being incredibly tightly linked. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to see what the difference would be. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, maintaining whichever you want to call it is quite important. Um, if you don't, it's going to show up emotionally and in all sorts of other ways. Um, so really looking after it is the key. OK, and I know bo both of us, unlike many people in the world of stress management, are very much into stress prevention, prevention being better than cure. I know that you work one to one with people, but also your, your speciality, the thing that makes you a little bit different to many people working in the well-being sector is that you have an engineering background. You is clever like that in it. <laughs> And <laughs> you you blend the wonderful stress prevention stuff with implementing it into organisations, teams, processes and systems. So um, can, can you give us an example of how a company could implement a well-being strategy? Yeah, and I think that's the important thing is to recognise what a strategy is, because an awful lot of organisations haven't got that far yet. Um, and it's definitely not a few intentions written on a piece of paper. So as you say, what, what I do with the strategy work is, is drawn from a, a history of working in industry long before I got anywhere near the wellbeing space and leading transformational programs. So I've got a lot of experience of going into organizations that are really quite stuck in firefighting mode. Yeah where there isn't actually very much capacity for doing anything different because all the capacity gets used up fighting the fires and gradually turning that into something that's approaching world-class. So the oh. building blocks of putting the strategy together are actually quite simple, but if one of the blocks is missing, the rest kind of wobble. So there's lots of organizations who I've spoken with. And, you know, one of the core questions I love to ask, maybe it's the engineer in me, is why? So when I'm speaking to organizations about what they're doing around mental well-being, and there's a lot of things like first aid training or um, awareness training so that people are more willing to talk about what they're experiencing, all sorts of activities. And when I say, you know, why did you choose that particular activity? Very often there's the kind of blank response of, what do you mean, why? <laughs> yeah, tumbleweed, yeah. That is a clear sign that it isn't strategic, that it isn't linked into everything else that's important in the organization. Tick box learning exercise. Yeah, and I don't think that's even intentional. I think no, it, no. Not, not usually. I mean, it can be sometimes that we're really busy and we've just got to do something and we've not got time to think about it. But one of the problems that that leads to is it yo-yos. What do so you mean by that? It's very typical where mental well-being gets loads of buzz and loads of energy when there's an awareness event, and then in between it disappears without trace. That is one of the biggest warning signs that it isn't strategic. Right. Because when it is, that momentum maintains even when the person who kicked it off gets busy doing something else, even when there's all the fires to fight. So it, it's that sustained momentum that starts to make all the difference. So consistency of action is essential. Um, I mean, I know in the education sector, stress is rife and they, they frequently have these little soundbite events. They're perhaps more than ever, it is that consistent approach that would create the biggest value and benefit, but not, not just in actually people's well-being, but it also has a business context in education and in industry, a measurable 
positive impact on um, longevity of staff, productivity and effectiveness of staff and and you know reduces um, sort of the furloughing of staff going off long term sick. Absolutely. Profit huge. Profitability goes up. It actually makes money and it's a legal requirement, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> let's be honest here. We should be doing it. We should. And okay. you know, there was a big there was a big study which was updated uh, summer last year. So a study by Deloitte that looked at uh, some national well-being programs and the kind of returns. So these are the proper hard cash returns that yeah. they get. Five pounds twenty for every pound invested. Whoa! I I remember doing a similar exercise with the chief exec group, and I just got them to write down all of the things that would cost them if if one of their key key leaders went off long-term sick with stress and that was including everything from advertising for a replacement um you, ev everything the impact and in one case the, the average in the room was somewhere between 30 and 100 thousand the biggest one was in excess of quarter of a million pounds wow and that's just because we're not strategizing and implementing a well-being and stress prevention program but yeah five-fold return on investment how many yeah. how many organizations are leaving that on the table it's true because they're true. too busy or it's just not got that right structure behind it crazy okay so we're, we're big on implementation here so people listening to this watching this um they'd love to have a go at something so the, whether or not they're watching the video here or listening to the audio as a podcast are there two things that if all of us did consistently on a daily basis, would create a massive positive impact for us? There are probably more than two, but I'll give you two. One of them, and well, it's mindlessly obvious, is to <laughs> breathe. Right. But breathe well. So I have a really favorite technique. I love to share this with everyone. It's, it's designed to get you back to emotional neutral quickly. So that could be if something's just wound you up and you don't want to stay in that kind of state, being able to clear it out of your system. Well, it this is happening to me right now. The internet's <laughs> been playing up all day. This is the longest it's stayed on, I'll be honest with you. Right. So, so I, I am, I'm a little bit her. So go on then, teach Excellent. me. Excellent. Right, me. so we're going to start off with two really deep, strong breaths. So proper diaphragm breaths. So you're moving the breath out of your shoulders all the way down. And as you breathe out... Imagine putting on that breath anything that you want shut off. So you could imagine it floating away like smoke or like little tiny helium balloons. Just a nice deep breath in and out. Feeling better already. And another one of those. And again. And then keep your eyes closed. Keep that breath flowing smooth and even. Really helps if you drop your shoulders as well. And just imagine that instead of being right inside your head, any thoughts that are going on are on a screen. So you've got that little bit of space between you and that screen just to let the breath really flow through your body and breathe away anything that's not helpful. How's that feeling? Yeah, better. Much better. Awesome. That is a real little and often technique. Two reasons for doing it often. Help stop your system getting onto that high alert that once it's there, it's quite difficult to get back from. The other reason is sometimes you'll want to get back to that emotional neutral really quickly. So if you're dealing with someone a little bit spiky and they've just said something that they're trying to poke a reaction out of you and you don't want to bite back, you can't go, hang on, I'm just going to breathe <laughs> and then I'll respond. It'd be great if you could. But you're very zen. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas if you're used to just taking a breath and letting go into that kind of neutral space, you can take a breath before you respond without that person even knowing. So like you're that. responding from a place of choice rather than a place of emotional hijack by what they've just said. Brilliant. Okay, so that's one. What else we got? 
The second one's a bit more generic. We, mm -hmm. We've kind of touched on, on managing stress and, and whether or not that's the right approach. It's better than not doing, but it does have some drawbacks. Right. One of them being that whatever approach you take to it requires doing something differently. So whether that's taking time to regularly practice mindfulness or yoga or journaling or gratitude, there's huge bodies of research about how effective all these things are, but only while we do them. And generally, when it comes to doing what's good for us, we don't. <laughs> even the we well intentioned. We yeah, even the well-intentioned people are intentioned to do it. So what, and in my case, I would do it, but I forget. So well, what, that's what, another reason. What are some of the things we can do to have like a little reminder? You will, reminder wise, you could set it on your phone. Mm -hmm. um, you could link it to something that you won't forget. So, for example, with that quick two minute breathe, the reset, link it to when you make a drink. Bacon. Or, when you knit to the loo or when you have your lunch or what could those are things that your body is not going to let you forget how to do yeah so if if you kind of tie it on and if you think something like cleaning your teeth you you don't consider whether to clean your teeth before you go to bed you don't suddenly get to one day and go don't feel like it it's so automatic it just happens without involving the sort of higher evolved areas of the brain so if there is a little and easy habit that you want to adopt, make it like cleaning your teeth. So if we can, okay, you say like cleaning your teeth, actually that is something we can do, isn't it? Why don't we practice? Absolutely. Whilst you clean. Okay, you'll be spitting toothpaste. <laughs> well, yeah, I was just thinking that might get a little messy, but yeah. <laughs> Why be Colgate off the bathroom teeth. mirror? But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, if while we're washing the face or doing our, our daily ablutions, Actually, that, that's twice a day where actually that could become yeah. routine. I like having it. a really good ha, having a really good sort of cleanse while you're in the shower is quite good because if you're cleaning the outside, why not have a bit of a clean of the inside as well? That makes perfect sense. Wonderful. Well, without wishing to abuse your good nature, we're going to. Um, the, the, <laughs> I've asked you for two top tips, and you've had, you've actually given us two things we can do. My other question was going to be. What could we do right now? You've already given us two. So selfishly, is there one last thing or do you want to leave it at two? Oh, no. Well, let's get another one in there as well. well another one that ties nicely with to that cleaning breathing yeah. is very often when we get wound up about something or stressed out about something or anxious, a lot of it is down to how we're talking to ourselves about that thing in our head. Internal dialogue stuff, you mean? Internal dialogue. We've all got one. And if anybody thinks they haven't, the little voice that just went, I don't talk to myself, was the little voice. <laughs> now, it's not all bad, because that's also the voice that says, oh, when you've done that, you need to remember to do that. Or you know, it, it, sometimes it's really, really helpful as well. But sometimes it can get a bit carried away. And when that happens, most people will either argue with it or try and reason with it, or try and persuade it to say something else. Right. Which can work, but can also send you into a bit of a battle with yourself. Okay. Which is really quite draining. So how can we prevent that? So what is often more effective, and I invite everyone to get creative with this, it can be great fun, is rather than trying to change what that voice is saying, experiment with changing how it sounds yes so if you've got a little worried voice in your head that probably sounds quite worried it's probably speaking quite loud and quite fast and saying oh no and all this is going to go wrong and blah, 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 blah. have it speak really slowly i have yet to find anyone the gauntlet is down the challenge is set who can worry really slowly I know someone who did that I don't I, and do you know what it's never clicked with me but it really worked for them you know you know when you breathe in helium from a helium balloon and, kick your nose, kick your nose. and they taught their negative voice to sound like that so they couldn't yeah. take it seriously Love yeah I've, I've used imaginary helium many many times Love it. Um, Love it. and the thing is 
I mean, there's there's a few sort of guidelines to get it to work really well. So, you know, there's that little bit of repetition so that you, you what you're basically doing is retraining your brain's autopilot because that automatic thinking that happens all by itself that sometimes isn't helpful, sometimes just needs a little bit of a nudge to do it nicer. Yeah. And it might be that what that voice was saying needs to be acted on, but saying it in a helpful way you're much more likely to engage with it and go, actually, yeah, I do need to pay some attention to that. Brilliant. So once you've found out whether it's with helium, whether it's making it slow, whether it's having a signal interrupts, whatever it does that interrupts that voice to make it feel better, repeat it four or five times. So what you do in there is retraining that autopilot, do it like this, do it like this. And then very often, the unhelpful, whatever it was going on, stops altogether. Brilliant. Absolutely first class. Wonderful information from a wonderful person. So if there's a um, corporate HR or L&D person going, okay, we need this strategy, or whether or not there's a group of head teachers going, we need our head sorted out. Um, <laughs> how can they get in touch with you, Sue? I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, Sue Evans. Uh, there's quite a few Evanses, and it's also fast-pathways.com is your one-stop shop for all things well-being. Oh, you've said that before. Loving it. <laughs> I haven't, actually. I'm not sure where that came from. <laughs> so you've been wonderful. Thank you as ever. God bless you. Thank you very much. Everyone else, please do, do sue the credit of applying something. That is the biggest compliment we can ever pay our expert contributors. Um, thank you very much, all of you. See you soon on another Dave's Desk. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and hit the notification bell for more videos. Then click the TV to watch the next video. Oh, and don't forget to visit our website at davidheiner.com to claim your free audiobook. Until the next time, go Rhino. Have in it.